summer's day to come here and listen to the fabulous David Ryan. I'm going to turn his video off a second. Um, so I'm sure you're possibly wondering why I'm stood up here introducing this fabulous man um, when Sue's organised this event. But I actually joined the business about five, six weeks ago, and it was for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons was um, in the last couple of years, we set up this new business which was recently launched, which was a hangover cure. And because of the nutrition and the research and development which was needed, <laughs> we, um, we realised that the having the nutrition knowledge was vital to the business. And so that's when we um, got in touch with Sue Worrell, who then could give us you know, all the nutrition advice that we needed. And after looking at the nutrition and what our bodies don't get from the food that we can buy in Tesco in the shops, we realized how um, inefficient the food was. And so that's why we looked at taking Juice Plus. And from that, we've, um, our health, um, for my family and myself, has improved dramatically. And my little testimonial to Juice Plus, even in the sort of three months that I've been taking it, um, it's quite funny really, and it's a little bit embarrassing, but my feet, especially in this weather, they should actually be massive right now and really, really sore and itchy. Um, so over the years, since being a kid, my feet used to swell up massively as a child to the point where I had to have the ends of my school shoes cut off so my toes could breathe. It was that bad. So when I go on holiday, or when I used to go on holiday, should I say, my feet would swell up to a size, like I looked as if I was a size 20 woman. So if you looked at the, my feet and you didn't look at the rest of my body, I literally looked like I was a size 20. So when I went to the doctors and I said to them, look, I need something for these feet, you know, what's going on? And they just laughed at me, the locum laughed, you couldn't believe it. So he tried me on some steroids, etc., and they helped a little bit, but not great. Then recently, just before we actually started the Juice Plus, um, all of a sudden, in the cold weather, which is really crazy, my toes started going purple, like as if I was an old woman. I thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. So um, I again went to the doctors and I said, look, this isn't right, they're going purple, then they're going white, and they're itchy, and they're sore, and I'm wearing sandals in the rain, so everybody thinks I'm crazy. I said, this isn't, this isn't right. And the doctor just looked at me and kind of went, yeah, I don't really know what's wrong with them, to be honest. That's not normal. I was like, thanks for that. So anyway, when we were in conversation with Sue about you know, our um, other product, um, and I was explaining my feet, she said, right, get on Juice Plus, give it a go, try it, see how you go. So a few weeks into it, my feet start calming down, they're not sore, and now, on the hottest day, if I wanted to, I thought I should have maybe worn heels just to prove a point, but my feet are absolutely fine. It's incredible. So that's my little testimony testimonial to Juice Plus. Um, so I'm going to now introduce you to Sue Worrell, um, a fabulous nutritionist, who is then going to introduce Dave, who you've all come to see. So thank you very much. Yeah, I can, I can tell you about that, because when um, we invited um, Charlotte and, and Matt to the first meeting, it was here actually, and we walked out and went to the bar for a chat after, and she had to take her shoes off, and you couldn't walk out, could you? It was hard to walk out. It was just amazing. So that's what happens. It's, it, it's to do with circulation, it's to do with blood supply, and it's to do with what the blood's supplying. So we've got a real treat for you. This is an audience with David Bryan. David Bryan is now an international speaker. He is much sought after. Um, lovely, lovely man, bit crazy. Um, but a lovely man. And uh, he's, his, his accomplishments are, are non-ending, no ending, but he will tell you about what he's done. The biggest thing he achieved is the Four Desert Run, which was truly amazing, especially at his age. And we saw him after the Sahara, and uh, I, I, he, he's, he looked amazing. He's been through hell, but he did look, still look amazing. So um, Dave Bryan was the, one of the reasons that I'm in the business, uh, because I've been taking Juice Plus for quite a few years, and as a nutritionist, I did not want to know um, being part of my business, really. I didn't want to take it on and, and work the business. I didn't sell stuff. I was not a salesperson um, at my own bottom about it. And then I decided about quite a few years after, about five years after, that I wanted to do something different. I got fed up with seeing people, particularly one little boy in, the, in my clinic in London, where he looked like my son, who unfortunately died when he was 10. And his diet was terrible, and his mum was not following my plan. 
So I gave her all her money back, which is quite a lot of money because it was a long course I was doing with her. And I said, I'm in Cardinal. Will you come and see me? I'm in Cardinal. On the way home, I thought, I'm doing something different. And I thought, I'm going to use Juice Plus for this. So the first thing I did was went to the, um, the meeting in Ireland, the Irish conference. Uh, they're all mad in Ireland. Um, the very <laughs> day is probably the maddest. Mm -hmm. And this guy came on stage and talked about fueling your body for repair and recovery and not performance. And I work with a lot of sports guys and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is just what I've been looking for. And, um, and they were lovely people as well, because I thought network marketers were sort of people who hunted you and shouted at you and forced you to buy stuff. But they were lovely people. Um, didn't know a soul when I went. Uh, three o'clock in the morning, I'm doing river dance with people I've never met before. <laughs> and the guy who was running the event said, what are you guys on? Because I've never heard anybody keep on going this long. And that was the turning point for me, and, and that was, I'm forever grateful for that. So I won't say any more, I'll introduce you to the amazing Dave O'Brien, and he will tell you the story. And after at the end, we'll take some questions from people, and uh, if you've got any special questions, come and ask me. Okay, Dave. Okay, uh, thank you for having me, guys. Um, where were we in Exeter yesterday and here today? And or is it Brighton tomorrow and God knows where the day after, but um, <clears throat> it's brilliant. And to get people out, it's now that it's almost impossible. I think things, most things are done on the internet now, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when do we actually even go out shopping and we just don't press a button or make a call and deliver to the house? And I know that does happen. And you're all busy people, every one of you. And come on, you could be doing something else today than sitting here doing this, couldn't you? I mean, getting stuff ready for work tomorrow, kids ready for school, yoga classes. I can just imagine you're busy, busy, busy. And yet, yet you decided to come out and here's something about health. And it's, it's kind of weird because we have this incredible body. We have an amazing body. We have a trillion dollar body. I mean, look, think about it. You cut your finger and it heals. You get a cold that goes away and it gets better with age, let me tell you, right? <laughs> and yet, we put more time and effort into a bloody shopping list than we do our own health. It, it beggars belief and I get really animated about this. So, so what I want to do tonight is, I'm not an expert in anything. I've got to tell you that now, make that quite clear. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a nutritionist. I left school at 15 to a round of applause. They were only delighted to see the back of me. <laughs> that is so true, you have no idea. But you know, at the end of the day, I think all you can do, isn't it, is give your own experience. And every one of you sitting here, there's a book in all of you, you've heard that before, it's true. You have ex brilliant experiences. Life is a roller coaster. And we give that to one another. And I often think, don't ever, ever underestimate that. Don't ever underestimate the power you have to change somebody's life to impact on somebody's life. Do you know what I mean? A smile, a handshake, a hug, just listen to somebody. People say, well, what can I do? You can do so much, it's unbelievable. And the very fact that you took time to come out tonight means a whole pile to me. And, and uh, you know, I, I think nowadays, as I said, it's so difficult to get people to do that. So, let's get into it. Now, I'm, I'm delighted to tell you that we have uh, no speakers at all. Uh, the gentleman at reception brought them to us. He was all excited and he said, there's your speakers, they're ready to go and they don't work. So I would normally not play this. This is a, um, a very quick uh, video of uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile. And just to give you kind of a flavor of what goes on in these deserts, yeah? And um, rather than not even show you pictures, I'll just run it for you there, all right? Let's plug it in now and see does it work. And uh, I don't know if you'll hear the sound off the computer, but if not, look, it doesn't matter. You get the general idea anyway. So. The joys of it. Okay then, um, we still don't have any sound, but we have picture, and that's I suppose 50% of it. This is the Atacama Desert, just going to fly through it there. I don't know if my computer is loud enough for you to hear, probably not, but let's have a quick look and see what it's all about, okay? So this is it. So no rain for over 500 years.
the office for God's sake. There you go. I don't know if you could get a little bit of that, but uh, I'm giving my idea. Thank you. So now, so that was one of the deserts uh, uh, in the Grand Slam in 2010. There were four of them. So we'll just bring up the PowerPoint presentation. And that's my, uh, my motley crew in the background there. great to show that we're all human. This isn't slick and you know what I mean? The whole thing. Far from it. But anyway, here we go. Yes, when you're ready. Thank you. Right then. Journey of Determination is what I call it basically and um, there's many talks I do around the world. This is one of them. And uh, what I call it that is I guess all of us at some stage are on that kind of journey. We all are. Every day of the week. And um, for me, uh, this running craze really started uh, would have been uh, many years ago, 1983. Most people know me for this. Uh, at 57 years of age, I got the, uh, the, the Grand Slam, and basically it was four deserts. Uh, there's a couple of medals, a bunch of medals, and uh, I'm delighted to say I did it, I came back alive. I uh, became the oldest man in the world to do it, and there was only two people that had done it before then. Uh, so nothing's impossible. I love that word split it in two, you know what I mean? Because it's not really what happens to you in life. Sure it's not, it's what you do with what happens to you. I mean, people think I'm on speed, I'm sure, half the time, but anyway. <laughs> but it's so true, life is brilliant. Even when we were going through a recession in Ireland, it was gas because, you know, I was saying to people, it's a great life out there, and people were kind of looking at me. Because when your back is against the wall, two ways you're going to go. You're going to go down, you're going to get up and fight. And uh, I always believed that there was never a better time at home when we had that recession to go out and make things happen for yourself and your family. So there you go, and I like to say we got it out of the way. This is me in minus six in Helsinki. Now, I am a barefoot runner, okay? And all I would say is that's a talk for another day. However, uh, the reason I don't wear shoes is I, I don't get it. Like, why would you possibly want to put a shoe on your foot when you're running? Put a half inch of shoe. Think about this. Put a half inch of rubber between your foot and the ground and expect your body to know what's going on. It doesn't. It can't. And the running shoe companies know that. And when you take off your shoe, your foot goes, hey, I'm not hitting the ground like that, and it lands perfectly. Your knees bend, and when you run with a bent knee, there's no impact. Your back, your spine, your hips go into a line. I saw the Moroccans do it in 1998, and uh, many years later, I saw a white South African do it, and I decided I'd start running barefoot myself. So minus six, your feet do freeze eventually. Yes, of course they do, but I got a good half an hour out of it, and it was brilliant, really enjoyed it. I can also run in the heat in bare feet, and this is Cordoba in Spain. I did a tour of Malaga, Marbella, Cordoba, and it was 42 degrees, as you can see, and there I am. That's a bit rough, that part, but generally it was okay. It was like that lizard, you know, hoo, 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 hopping from one foot to the other. And getting back here again, um, when I was out in Helsinki, Torsten, a friend of mine, I was running a circuit around his house, and he, he went to the window and he saw I had no shoes. He said, Jesus, Mary, what's he doing? He ran down. As I came by the house, he called me, and I went over to him. He said, what in the name of God do you think you're doing? He said, are you crazy? He said, I said, what's wrong with you, Torsten? He said, you're going to get your death. The cold out there, you're going to get something. I said, it won't, but I'm fine. I said, I'll be all okay. If you have a strong immune system, that's not going to be an issue. So anyway, he kind of went away puzzled and I continued running for another little bit. That was, uh, as you can see, nearly four years ago. So most things are possible, guys. That's the good news. Um, that's uh, me in uh, Memphis. I love uh, in St. Jude's in the Memphis Marathon. Uh, St. Jude's Hospital is a hospital for sick children. And in uh, over 50 years ago when the, the hospital opened, the survival rate, uh, cancer survival rate for children was somewhere around 22%. And I'm delighted to, to say today, the survival rate is in the 80%. And just plus, uh, we fund that hospital quite a bit every year. It's the least we can do. Money is the easy bit, of course. Uh, but anyway, Jay Martin, our CEO, said, you want to run a full marathon with shoes or a half marathon without? So I said, I'll do the half without. And I don't normally run on the concrete. It's normally grass. So when I finished the race, you can't really see it there, but my feet were cut to bits. Um, but it was a great race. They weren't damaged, you know. It was just the skin wasn't uh, tough enough to take the, the, the surface was unbelievably bad out there. You would imagine for a main city, it'd be good. The roads were horrendous. Um, so it was a little bit painful, but it was a great run. I had a great run and I finished. And uh, it was the least I could do for those amazing kids. So here I am in 1983. Now this is where you two actually did all their, um, when they were sort of uh, grouping themselves uh, in Dublin. And uh, I took a couple of shots outside. Now you see a lot of graffiti. I was into that in those days. I used to spray everything, and then the police would run after me, and that's how I became a runner. <laughs> you don't believe that either. So, uh, but on a serious note, um, 
You know, a lot of people often say to me, why, you know, I'm a very driven person, I'm a very focused, a very passionate person, and where does it come from? And come on guys, all of us sitting here, it comes from our home, doesn't it? It comes from our upbringing, from our parents, from our siblings, from our friends, the people we hang out with. We're shaped all the time, and for me, I suppose I go back in time a little bit into 62. I mean, I was very young, eight years at the time, and my dad left. He decided he'd go off somewhere else and enjoy himself, and he left my mum and five children behind. And this is a story that's told over and over again, and no different to a lot of people. So, but the amazing thing was that my mum, she was left with nothing. She would no home, she would no finances, um, she would no stability of any, any kind. And uh, what she had was her children, and she refused to give us up. She worked three jobs. And my mum, she gave up her freedom so as her children could have theirs. And you know, that's the ultimate sacrifice, isn't it? That's what a mum does. I have so much respect for women and for mums. It's just amazing. She's my hero. She's 88, she's still going strong, and she's still giving out to me. Bless her. Um, but you know, and it was a wonderful home we grew up in, and we can never, I can never remember being without. Do you know what I mean? No matter what she had to do, she did it for us. Um, the other thing too was I remember the truck came along and when I talk about uh, what shapes us and the pivotal moments in our life, we had this lovely house, dad had a good job and we had a lovely house and this truck came one day and took all the furniture, loaded it into an open truck and drove to 47 Casement Grove, Fingless West, the wild west in, in Dublin and it is wild and um, a, a corner house, my mum still lives there today, threw all the furniture literally unceremoniously into the garden, went back for a second load and a third load and then drove away for good. And as they drove away the last time, uh, I'm not being dramatic about it, but I remember holding on to my mum, and there were, my brothers were there, my three brothers, myself and my sister, and I was holding on to my mum, I was looking up to her, and I will never forget that look in my mother's eyes. And she didn't want to give anything away, but she did, you know, I saw it. And, and it was incredible, I mean, she, she never married, she never had another relationship, she was in despair but she was going to drive on, she was going to carry on. And at that moment, I made up my mind that I was going to do whatever it took to make sure my mother was okay. I was eight, what could I do? I didn't know, I hadn't, but I was going to make sure. And that is where I come from. And that, I suppose, why I am very driven. I am very passionate. And it's not always about money. In fact, most of the times it's not about money. It's about other things that are important. It's bringing value to other people in this world. That's really what it's all about, isn't it, guys? So, mom is my hero. And um, so that's what I just want to give you a little bit of background of, as I said, where I come from. And that's why in school I did leave early. The reason was that I, I wanted to get out there. I wanted to bring home a wage packet. I wanted to give it to someone to help. And uh, I did leave at 15 and I did start work straight away. And I would shovel you know what. I would do it in the morning if it meant, it's no problem. Just get out and do it. Don't talk about it. I think Nike stole that saying from my mother. Just do it. Because <laughs> she did. So there you go, uh, really that's the whole story there. And um, so bringing a bit much uh, more up to date, um, the pivotal moments for me were that, when that happened that day. And there have been other pivotal moments in my life, particularly uh, in the running scene. Uh, I, I remember a local guy was running the Dublin City Marathon. It was the second time it, uh, it was run through Dublin. And it was only the second major marathon in the world at that time. Would you believe it? 1983. And I, I, I went to see my neighbour. My mum said, go up and see Cyril. He had a sweet shot. He's running this marathon. I said, I didn't even know what a marathon was, except it was a long distance. And Cyril came through the village. And he, the crowds were out with banners and they were cheering him on. And I said, Jesus, this is brilliant. I'd have to have a cut off this. <laughs> so the following year, guess what I did? I bought a pair of running shoes. I signed up for the race. But the only problem was, I had no training. Now, I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. What happened was, I tore ligaments in both my knees. I didn't even know what a ligament was in those days. And I came down Leeson Street, and my brother said I played my ace, and I was like this. Honestly, the pain was excruciating. My left knee had started, then I went to my right knee, and I couldn't lift my knees at all. And I did this thing, I'm going to finish no matter what. And for the men in the audience, that's not macho, that's stupidity, I have to tell you, right? <laughs> However, I finished, and my wife was in, coming across the park. I was with my brother Barry, and I saw her, and I said, oh, here's trouble. She walked across me, and said, what in the name of God? I told you, no training. And I said, what did you expect? You can't even bloody go walk, she said. And she was upset. She hugged me. I looked over her shoulder at my brother Barry, and I went, <laughs> I made another decision, that if I could repair these knees, just, just get them right again, I would run one marathon, I would train, and I would run a marathon without any injury. See, that was the plan. Well, the good news is the following year, I'm delighted to say, it took, by the way, about three months for my knees to come right. Uh, and when I did, I signed up for the next year in 1984. I ran that marathon and uh, it went well. 
I finished it. There was no pain in my knee or anything like that. And since then, I've run a couple of races. I've run, as you can see, in Berlin, Dublin, London, Cork, Boston, all over the world. I think about uh, 60 plus uh, marathons. And races, uh, I've nearly 600 races under my belt, uh, seven deserts. I hold the record for climbing the seven highest peaks in Ireland in 23 hours, 28 minutes. Now, they're not Mount Everest, they're only 3,000 3, feet. But anyway, I'm not up here to say how great I am doing all this stuff, because I can tell you, there are people out there that have done 10 times this amount. So that's not really the point. The point is that over a 31 year period of over 600 races, I'm putting my body through stuff that nobody should ever do. I have never ever been sick or injured or missed a race due to sickness or injury. And that, my friends, is not just good luck or good genes. It's good health, exactly. And that's all I can give you. Do you know what I mean? I can only give you my story. And there's a reasons behind good health. It's not fitness, let's not get confused. People get really confused with that. People see people in the gym and they're ripped and they say, there's a fit, healthy guy. Uh, 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 uh. They may be fit, but are they healthy? Fit people can and, and do unfortunately die. So there's a big difference and I'll go into that in a minute. So in all that time, as I said, I've never been sick or injured whatsoever, thank God. So uh, it's health, and health is the big one. Um, no injuries there, and uh, the only time I injured myself was when I was on stage in Long Beach, and they announced me, and they, they said this thing, but I've done all these races, and he's never been injured. And as, he, as the, the guy presenting me mentioned injured, it was a massive stage, 6,000 people. I flew out, fell over to speak purposely, and rolled over and landed up in front of them, just to get a laugh. My wife says I suffer from ASD. You know what that is? Attention-seeking disorder. <laughs> Apparently. Anyway, so look, uh, this was uh, what I did is I saw an ad for the desert, uh, the Sahara Desert, and I decided no one from Ireland had done it, I said I'm going to do it. 250 kilometers, self-sufficiency, there's a couple of water stations along the way, you carry everything on your back, and I thought, jeez, this is great. There was, was a whole, you know, the excitement of it already, and I really wanted to have a go off that. And by the way, what, what attracted me to this race was, uh, I think it was the Daily Mail or one of those papers, and I was reading that um, there was a race in the desert, and you know, you could run it, uh, you have to carry all this stuff, you got blisters, and I was going, yeah, yeah, I'm into that, that's okay, no problem. And then it was things like, you know, the, the 40 degrees plus, and it was all this kind of stuff. And I was really close, here's the news, this is actually the newspaper article. And I was that close, but you know the way sometimes you need that extra little push, you know what I mean? And then I read about this Italian guy, and he only survived by drinking his own urine. I said, where do I sign, come on. <laughs> so I did the race, I had a good race, top 100, I came back home again, and uh, I went again two years later, I went out and did another one. But the decision for me was, was instant, guys. And, and I, I talk about this a lot around the world. If you do anything in life, grasp it with both hands and jump in with both feet and go for it. What is it that happens to us? We have, we're a ball of energy. We have these dreams when we go, and it's not there with us sometimes. We live in a negative world. I mean, turn on the radio, television, open a magazine, even talk to people at times. All the, I'm not putting my head in the sand. All I'm saying is, you know, there's so much negativity out there, and people try and take things away from you. If there's something you desperately want, I say to my kids, grasp it, go out there. Providing it's legal, go out there and do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, 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 it's up to you, and you can, if it's something you really want. If your why is big enough, you go out for it. So the decision was instant. I went off, and as I said, I became the first Irishman to do it. I came back to this book, look at this. I mean, I'm such a shy individual that it was difficult to read this. <laughs> Sahara Shuffle. Can Dave do it? Snakes, scorpions, sandstorms, you know, all this stuff. Uh, how about this one? Dave of Arabia back home. <laughs> this is my, my youngest boy, who's 25 now, and uh, but you can see him there. He didn't recognize me in that Arab gear when I got off the plane initially. Didn't know what was going on, but my favorite one. Look at this, superhuman effort and race of death. You know what I mean? They really <laughs> dramatize it, don't they? They really do. So I went back, as I said, two years later, and I did it a second time to prove that the first time was and, uh, you know, the desert runner for me wasn't the end, but it was the beginning, because there's something about a desert that's so pure. Like, when you're out there, trust me, the only thing you want is a spritzer. You know what I mean? A spray of water in your face. Think about it, you're there, it's 40 degrees, it's beating down on top of you, you've got 10 kg in your back, you see a checkpoint, you go, oh, thanks for the God, you go in, you fall down, and someone comes over and sprays your face with water. Oh, lad, there's nothing like it. <laughs> I mean, no seriously, but can you imagine if life was that simple? You turn on a tap and get cold water, yes, or a bed to sleep in. Oh my God, or the luxury of a pillow. You know, Dave O'Brien needs a kick in the ass every now and again to remind me how lucky I actually am, how lucky we all are. You know, and I'm not trying to get anything with this, but I mean, I always give thanks that I have what I have. And um, 
you know, so it doesn't really matter how big your walk-in wardrobe is or what color your car is or any of that stuff when you're out there. You just have to survive. So the spiritual is the big one, but it taught me a lot. So for me, it was really, honestly, only the beginning. Now, I was doing fine, minding my own business, when guess what? I'm on the internet. And I come across this crowd called Racing the Planet. Oh, my God, says I, what's this about? Racing the Planet. I was intrigued, to say the least of it. And then I read that you could do one desert, and 12 weeks later, you could do another one, and 12 weeks later, you could do another one, and five weeks later, you could do another one. Jeez, I was like a child in a sweet shop. <laughs> and when I read, wait for this, that only two men in the world had ever done it, and they're totally professional, which is that my decision was made. I grasped them with both hands, I jumped them with both feet, and I said, this is it, I'm gonna go for it. Did I worry, was I too old? Would I die out there? Would I have enough money? Would I get time off? No, not at all. I made that decision. I worried about the rest of it later. <laughs> so this is the deal. Atacama Desert, Chile, 250 kilometers. 12 weeks later, I ended up in the Gobi Desert in China and another 250 kilometers. 12 weeks after that, we literally melted away in the Sahara Desert and five weeks after that, ended up in Antarctica. You're going from about 40 degrees to minus 30 wind chill. And as I was doing these four races, I began to understand why only two people in the world had actually done it. Um, but it went well, thankfully. That was all good. It worked out super good. Work. So the decision to do it again was absolutely yes. I'm going to do this. Now, I was in Long Beach, California, and I was doing, uh, I announced at that, that meeting, as I said, a large audience that I was going to do this, the oldest man and all that stuff. And this lady came backstage, it's true, and she introduced herself. She said, my name is Jennifer Steinman from New York. I'm a film producer. She said, let me get this straight. You want to run a race that only two men have done. They're fully professional. They're half your age. You're only an ordinary Joe Soap. You're going to kill yourself. Can I make a film about it? <laughs> in that order. So anyway, and the other, the other problem I had was that my wife was in the audience that night as well and I hadn't told her. <laughs> so she did come backstage and she said, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Now, on a serious note, uh, my boys were delighted. Ian, Colin and David, they're six foot three. The lads were, woo, the Irish Superman. Yeah, great stuff, Dad. You know the macho thing? But my wife, my daughter, Jackie, my mum, they were horrified. And it's not because they were worried I'd get sick or injured. They were worried that if I got sick or injured, I wouldn't stop. And they were right. And I can tell you here and now, as I said earlier, it's not macho, it's stupidity, and it's selfish if you have a family. People die trying to do this. And, um, you know, they did support me. Thankfully, they did 100%, and it went okay. But looking back on it, it is a selfish thing to do. And, and I've got to admit that. Hands up. Um, anyway, it all worked out well. Uh, we, got, we got back home. We came back alive. So let's have a look at them very quickly. March, June, uh, October, and then we went into November to finish Antarctica. They call it a desert in Antarctica because it doesn't rain uh, out there. Uh, you've already seen this on the VT clip. Me saying, what the hell am I doing here? And I actually meant it. 11,500 feet above sea level. It's not Mount Everest, I know, but a little bit of, you know, you can get headaches, a little bit of nausea and stuff like that. I was okay, thankfully. All the gear you carry on your back, uh, your food, your sleeping gear, your clothes. Hi, everybody. Come on in. woo -hoo! Um so this is all the gear that I carry. And would you believe it? I actually got my toothbrush and I cut the stem off the toothbrush to save weight. Now, did you ever try brushing your teeth with a stem? I nearly swallowed it three or four times. An Irish toothbrush, I guess, yeah? But anyway, that's, that's that. And the other thing is people always ask me, how much water do you drink out there? How much water? Well, we drank somewhere in the region of between, uh, you know, eight to 10 or 12 liters. Isn't that better? How's that for you, no? That's, that was really annoying me, guys. There you go. Okay, dopey. So, uh, yeah, I used to go through about 10 litres a day. And the trouble is that, obviously, if you don't, you can lend yourself up in a lot of trouble. Now, if you don't believe me, this is a runner here who never made it, okay? <laughs> yeah, joke. No, of course I'm only joking. It was a wild animal. He attacked me, and I killed it with my bare hands. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Bear Grylls, okay? But on a serious note, on a serious note, honestly, I saw more guys go down out there because they didn't get the water rationing right. There's plenty of water, there's no excuse, you just have to carry it. Um, so that was one of the big deals out there, obviously. The cameras were there, there was no pressure. Seven was on my tail all the time. I lost them though after that, thankfully. The salt flats, um, they, they weren't pleasant because, you see this, this is like a coral reef, it's salt, it's hard salt. So what you do is, I was on these for, I think about five and a half hours, so, so what you do is you, you jump like this from, from, and if your foot goes into the water, it's pure salt. And if unfortunately, your feet are a little bit cut up, all oh, the pain of it, it's, it's horrible. And the other thing I found was, you see, sometimes you jump from one to the other and you go bang, 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 so you hit your front of your runner, 
and it makes uh, your toenails, you, you kill them, you know what I mean? They go black. And when that happens, you've got to pull them off. And at that rate, I pulled off five of my toenails, 50% of them. Uh, no, but uh, see, I know it sounds terrible, but, but they're, they're in the way. They genuinely are. And the good news is, come on, they grow again. You know what I mean? They do. You know, see, that's, the, that's the power of the body to heal. Seriously. So um, I know you're all going to sign up after this. I've got a lovely guy down there, Kevin. Am I right, Kevin? And this man is going to run 200 miles self-sufficiency, right? He was telling me at the start of it. And uh, I'm going to be tracking you and watching you. Uh, you shouldn't tell me because I'd, I'd love to join you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I know that. So brilliant. And again, you know, I, I'm not going to wish you luck. You're not going to need it. You're going to kick ass out there. I know that. But absolutely brilliant. Respect. Big time. Uh, so I came in, threw my hat in the air, got a hug, and I got a medal, and, and that was pretty much it. Uh, so the next race, 12 weeks later, was China. Now, a lot of people think I'm only Dave O'Brien from Ireland, and nobody knows me, really. But in China, I'm well known. I am, so I swear to God, I'm very well known to China. And in case you don't believe me, I have uh, proof here. Um, <laughs> now then. Uh, the only thing that gives us away is that the king doesn't wear running shoes, I guess. Uh, I couldn't help but have a bit of a laugh at that. Uh, Gobi Desert was extraordinary because you know why it was... You remember I said the Atacama Desert was 11,500 feet above sea level. The Gobi was 400 feet below. Second lowest point in the globe uh, outside the Dead Sea. And um, it was an oven. I'll never forget it. It was an incredible place. And very barren. Look at this. You've got something like... It's like the, it's like the surface of Mars. And then you've got a lot of this stuff as loose shale. And, and this is really dangerous stuff because you, know, you, you can go on it and if you slip on that, it's sharp, it just cuts your skin, you know, your tie, your arm. I see a lot of damage. I saw a fellow bust his knee, an Italian guy bust his knee open uh, on one of the days on that, so it's not good. And the water crossings are only up to the ankle there, but sometimes they'd be up to your waist. And there was only three or four crossings in the Gobi. There were 13 crossings in the Atacama, water crossings. Um, so it's, it, all the terrain is different. Here are some of the injuries. This is yours truly. These are two different people, but these two are me, obviously. Now, it's okay. And would you believe it? The Gobi was the only desert of the four that I had anything like this. Yeah, you get blisters and you just burst them and bleed them and stuff, but, but this was bad. So what you do is you get a scalpel. I used to do my own running repairs. You cut away the skin, throw it away, use iodine, you clean it really well. That's the trick, right? Uh, you put a lot of cream and it bandages, put it into your shoe and off you go again. Now, it is painful. Um, but you don't, you know what I mean? You don't really remember the pain afterwards. You remember the adulation finishing, but you don't really remember. Because if you did, you would not do it again. I guess it's a bit like childbirth. I don't know what I'm only saying. Um, so that's the, the feet cut up a small bit there. Um, the one thing I hoped I wouldn't have to relate, guys, is what I'm going to tell you now. And I always felt, it's weird, I always felt they took chances, you know? I don't mind saying this in public. I've said it in public all over the world. Uh, the organization who run this took chances. And one day, on the fourth day in the, Go in the, in the Gobi, we went through this valley here. Do you see this? It's, they're not very tall now, but they're like, uh, it's like a little maze. We went in there at the start down there, and then we, it, it sort of went like this. It was 15 kilometers. The ground core temperature was 46 degrees. Now, you think, I'm you think it'd be shaded and it'd be cool. It wasn't. It was exposed to sun and it trapped the heat. I don't know how that worked, but I'm just telling you what happened. I came across a guy in trouble. I put his head down. He said, I'm grand. I said, no, I'll stay with you till someone comes along. Another runner came along, and then I, I went. When I came to the finish, I came out here. And when I came running down there, you know, the momentum just, just gets you down. And my sleeping bag came out of the, the elastics, and it finished. It got down before me, in actual fact. And when I got to the finish, just was about to tell one of the organizers there was trouble up there in Fire Valley, and I looked into her eyes, and I could see it straight away. I said, there's a problem, but you know it already. She said, yeah. They'd sent a doctor up with a camel and three people. And when they found Nicholas, a uh, 31-year-old American, uh, he was in a coma. And um, he, he didn't make it. He did, we knew he was going to die. He died on the, on the Saturday. It should never have happened. And you know, it's, for, it's weird because we all understood how vulnerable all of us were. You, you know what I mean? We're not superhuman. We're the same as anybody else. Some people packed it in on the spot. They did. They packed it in. Other people were very cautious because the following day was the long day, 110 kilometers. And how it works is you get up on a Sunday, you run a marathon. You get up on a Monday, you run a marathon. You get up on a Tuesday, another marathon. Wednesday, another marathon. Thursday, you run two and a half marathons. And then Friday is a simple run into you know, 10K, just into the finish. So that's the way it works. So this, the following day after that chap died, after Nicholas died, we had a long run. And I made up my mind at that stage that I was not going to leave anybody behind. The race was over for me. I, I was going to finish it, but as a race. I mean, the age of my children, for God's sake, you, you just couldn't leave anybody behind. 
and that's what I did. So, uh, cutting this story short, this is a, a picture I put up all over the world, and it, it, I think it says everything really. I've been on my feet for 27 hours without sleep, and this young man, his name is Hugh, from the British Army, fitter than I could ever be. This guy was running 100 mile runs with a backpack, I kid you not. Unbelievable. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't know what a 100 mile run was in training if it bit me in the ass. I've, I've never run a 100 mile in training. I have when I'm out there. But. So here he is, the thinnest. I could never be as fit as this man here. But he was sick and he was ill. I had him for a couple of hours. And when we came through the finish, obviously somebody had a camera and took this picture. And just shortly after that, he swung the alarm around and he hugged me and he started to cry. He was crying like a baby. It seemed like an eternity, probably a minute or two. And uh, we are good friends. It's amazing. He's a lovely, lovely young man. Um, but anyway, here's the point. So I'm twice his age, I'm not nearly as fit as he is, but when I put this up on the big screen, I circle my face and I go, that's health. And then I circle Hugh's head. <coughs> and I go, that's fitness. That is the difference between fitness and health. And I will briefly go into it in a minute. So uh, I, I think it's a very interesting thing and it's something that I really got stuck into and wanted to find out more. So there you are, another made another hug, and before I know it, I'm in the Sahara Desert. Now the Sahara Desert, I'm gonna fly through this one, there's only three or four slides. I, I hate it, I got bad water, and when you get bad water, it's, it's serious. Uh, I got diarrhea out there for four days, they gave me a modium trying to stop it. Almost took me out of the race, another story for another day, but I made it. Um, this is a checkpoint. Now, if you put an arrow there for you, there's a checkpoint. Imagine for one moment, just humor me, that we all have a backpack on and we're in the Sahara Desert. Right, we're going to turn around, we're all together, you're all with Dave O'Brien, you're following me, here we go. God help you, but anyway, okay, we're running. Where's the bloody checkpoint? Ah! There it is, you, you boy! There's the checkpoint. And one hour later, it's exactly in the same place. <laughs> There's no reference in the desert, it will break your heart particularly if you're not having a good day. So, I mean, I, I love throwing that one up because it's, it's sort of, you, you sort of don't really understand it until you're out there. There's no references. Uh, the finish, you come in, they put up a tent, you carry everything. You carry your ground mat, your sleeping bag, your clothes, your food, and so on. This is the toilets. The reason I put those up, just to show you what you pay about 4,000 euros for uh, five-star treatment. Because in 1998, when I went to the Sahara Desert from the Moroccan side, from Warzazat, and we did the race, there was none of these screens at all. So you went out till you were a dot, you dug a hole, you did what you had to do. So when I came back to Ireland, I was digging holes in my back garden for a week. <laughs> and my wife would look down at the children, uh, they'd look up to her and she'd say, he'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have to laugh guys, because if you don't, it's all over. Anyway, uh, the cameras were everywhere and I, I, sometimes I got a little bit upset with them, uh, but that, look, that's what they were going to do. Um, uh, but they were pretty good on the, most of the time. This is a shot that I put up near the end of my presentation of, of this section, and you can see those eyes there. I hadn't, I couldn't hold anything in for four days. Uh, I had diarrhea, it was really bad. I had no energy, my energy was going down, I was losing my eyesight. Um, I think I asked somebody for my jacket out of the car, so obviously I wasn't really there 100% of the times at this checkpoint. And uh, anyway, I recovered brilliantly, thank God. I didn't need any major medication of any kind. In fact, the emodium was the only thing I took for four days, and that was it and everything got back to normal. But when I look at that picture, it always reminds me of one thing. I always say, you know what, there's a time in your life when, I don't know, mentally, physically, spiritually, you're drained. A really tough time in your life when you think, damn it anyway, this is crazy stuff. Like, you know, you feel like you can't go on. I always say, in my experience, I always say, never give up, guys. Because there's always, always, always one more step. Is the truth. There always is. When you just think there's no more left, there's always one more step. And that's what I would definitely put across to everybody here. Because four hours later, I'm flashing my gnashers and everything is fine. <laughs> okay, we finished the race, uh, got a medal again. The only thing I didn't like about the finish was having to run up and down those things. That was a bit difficult. But that was <laughs> so three down, the last one was here, and this one was Antarctica. Can you imagine getting the opportunity to run or walk in the footsteps of Shackleton, of Scott? of our own Tom Crean in Ireland, amazing explorers, and I got the chance to do that. So five weeks later, I'm out there, and this is a talk for another day, so we're not going to go into it. But the reason I'm steering the ship, by the way, is the captain was seasick, so it was rough seas. Uh, the skies changed. You know the way you look out here and you see the clouds coming in? Over there, boom, straight away they're on top of you. And if you take off your gloves, they warn you, be careful. 
for to do something very small for a very short amount of time. I used to time it on my watch. It used to take my fingertips 28 minutes on average to get the blood back in them again. Extraordinary, very dangerous, but a magnificent race. And it was just an honor to be given the opportunity to go out there and run the last, uh, we call it the last desert. So there we are, a beautiful backdrop. Finished the race uh, and uh, it went well, thankfully. I finished it, came back, came back healthy. I uh, got a bunch of medals again in the set and it was all done. So we did it in a 38-week period. So for me, this is, it was really all about, you know, in life, as I said, when you want to do something, just grasp it and go for it. Because this Chinese proverb is brilliant, I love it. And, and it always says, the person who says it can't be done shouldn't interrupt the person who's doing it. But it's so true, isn't it? It really is, I love that. And, and when we're on this subject, I always talk about other things like, well, what am I going to do next? What could I do next? And uh, my brother Barry reckons I should do Irish hand gliding. That's the next level up. H have you seen Irish hand gliding? Yeah? You want to see it? I'll show it to you some. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different, um, but I, I think I'll be up for it, to be honest. So here it is. Beautiful, really. Look at that. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to do next. It's certainly not going to be hanging out of a helicopter anyway. Uh, but uh, so, okay, so in wrapping up the two sessions very briefly, I always say two things. One is there's always one more step. We take nothing else out of it by that we're amazing human beings, mentally, physically, and spiritually. There always is, honestly, in my opinion and in my experience. And the last thing is, what's the number two? Never ever give up. Ah, oh, sure, you've done this before, for God. It's like being in school, isn't it? <laughs> because that frog is not going down. There's no way. I love that. I absolutely love it. Okay, so that's the way I kind of look at stuff. So let's get back into the real important thing. There's a, a couple of medals there, and. Uh, that's okay, but this is the, the business I always talk about. I would hate to have reached the age of say, please God, 85, 90, and said I'd love to have done those deserts. Do you know what I mean? I just went and I did them. So don't live with regrets. I love this, I stay up late every morning and realize it's a bad idea the next morning, it's brilliant. Um, so I always say that. They did a, a, a survey of old folks' homes in America, and they did it, this, uh, it was compiled by a very um, uh, well-known um, organization and they found that most of the people that they interviewed over a period of 10 years didn't really regret stuff they'd done but they certainly did regret not having tried or left it behind so you know we always want to try and fulfill ourselves this is a cat get him out of there he's in his comfort zone for god's sake get out where the magic happens okay sometimes we have to go outside our, our comfort zone and dig into that you all know this stuff you know your desire to change must be greater than your desire to stay the same and I think we get into a rut, even I do, we all do. And um, you know, sometimes you have to be shaken up. I love this slide, the next one, because it's about uh, you know, having ups and downs. We all have, it. life is a roller coaster. As the slide says, if there's no ups and downs in your life, it means you're dead. And uh, you know, sometimes you wonder, why do these things happen to me? Why me? And I always feel there is a reason. Sometimes it's very hard to explain what that reason is, particularly when it's serious stuff that happens. So, um, but it's a good slide, and I love putting it up there, I love using it. And be resourceful. Oh my God, if I hear another person say to me, I wish if only my boss would give me more money, or if only my employees would work harder, or if only I won the lottery. It's not about resources, for God's sake. It's about resourcefulness. Each and every one of you sitting down with myself, we have exactly everything we need within us to achieve what we need to achieve. If I had this, if I had, you don't need your habit inside you, it's there. If you really want it, boom, you will find a way. You already have everything you need and more. And you know, this passion, I talk about this all the time. People seem to lose that over time. There's this lovely like, kind of energy. It's like, zap, 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 everybody has it. But sometimes you have to reach in and drag it out. You know what I mean? I'm not expecting everyone to run around and be plugged into a socket like I am, but there's an energy there. And sometimes it just goes, doesn't it? You know, what happens to us over time? And uh, so I always talk about passion. What was that, that lit that fire? What was the fire in the belly? I try and get that back again sometimes. And uh, so I love to show this picture. Because the two things here, I always say there are two great days in a person's life. The day that you were born and the, the, the time you realize, the day we discover why. So why are we here? Why are we doing what we do? Um, and, and this is a big one, isn't it? I guess if it's important enough to you, you're going to go out and you're going to make it happen. Give yourself a perfect day. Go to bed with a dream and wake up with a purpose. This is stuff you know. But anyway, let me show you my favorite picture. <laughs> you see, I, I guess that within each and every one of us, there's a voice in there that wants to get out and sing. I know you're a singer, you beautiful singer. I haven't heard you yet, but I will. I can't sing a note, by the way. But the, you know what I mean by that? Within all of us, there's something we desperately want to do. So what I say is, sing as if your life depends on it. And uh, 
you know, it shouldn't, but just do it. Forget the reason why it won't work and think of the one reason why it will and focus on that. And when I say focus, that's focus. <laughs> <laughs> because that dog is going to get that ball no matter what happens, isn't it true? You're right, but the, the heat in here is unbelievable, isn't it? Why is it that the speaker normally, I normally have a glass of water with a lemon in it and everybody's parched and they're looking at you and there's no kind of air going through the room. So I do apologise for this, okay? So I will try to speed it up now. So we're talking about focus and the dog. And the other thing I talk about is getting a buddy. You know, we all need to bounce things off. A mum and a daughter, you know, a work colleague, a workmate, we all need a buddy. This is the buddies, you know, this is one of them. Oh. Oh. If only I had a shotgun, huh? But, uh, <laughs> no, it's a beautiful dog, in fairness. Um, and th this business of average, I, I, the reason I put these little bits and pieces in is because it's kind of what I find out when I'm, when I'm going around the world. People kind of come to me and talk to me about different things. And, and average is a big thing I get. Like, like nobody wants, as, as it says there, nobody wants an average seat in a restaurant, do we? Or nobody wants an average meal, for example. Or how about an average relationship? I mean, how the hell would that work? It wouldn't. Oh, don't be looking at one another now. <laughs> I'm watching you. Or how about it? An average pilot. <laughs> See, there were two Canadians. Yeah, they're, go they're, they're going to be charged. Unbelievable. Yeah, drinking. Yeah, they boarded the plane and they were way over the limit. The 263 people in the plane. Crazy. So we don't want average pilots, and we certainly don't want an average brain surgeon. Now, what about average health? And this is the bit that I don't get. We, we freak over these two, but when it comes to average health, yeah, okay, you can take it or leave it. I mean, what is it about health? Why do we not worry about it until we haven't got it? I, I just don't get that. I can never, never understand that. People don't worry about their health until they haven't got it. It's a big thing. I mean, that's what I find from going around all the time. Health is your wealth, you know that. Or to put it another way, they don't worry until they haven't got it. Um, the other thing I find is it's prevention. I tend to talk to people about do something about it now. If you're on a plane, God forbid, and the, the, the oxygen mask comes down, what do you do? You put it on yourself first. So you owe it to yourself to be healthy, to be good, so as you can be good for your kids, your family, your friends. You know, it's not being selfish, it's being sensible. So prevention rather than in intervention. And the big one here is disease care versus health care. They say in Ireland, if I hear it one more time, I lose control. The healthcare system says this or the health. We don't have a healthcare system. We have a disease care system. I mean, what the hell ever happened to prevention and education? It's insane. Unfortunately, it's a disease care. I'm not knocking the medical profession. All I'm saying is it can't be just a pill for an ill. There has to be a more broadened approach, a more holistic approach. We treat disease. That's what we do. I mean, how many people here, this is not a trick question, how many people here go to the doctor for health? Well, could I suggest you don't? Could I suggest you go to the doctor for treatment? Not health, for treatment. Health is what you give yourself through diet and lifestyle changes. I live one mile from the CUH, the Cork University Hospital. My office, my bedroom, looks out at the roof of that hospital, right? It's in the distance, one mile away. I can walk into that hospital any time of the night or day. And with proper diet and lifestyle, 50% of those people need not be in those beds. It's an absolute I mean, I want to slap people sometimes. It's not very politically correct, but you know what I mean? Come on, guys. I am 63 years old. I want to be around in 30 years' time with a sharp mind and without a stick and to be with my family. And you can and don't let any doctor tell you anything different because it is not true. I'm not saying things don't happen with age. Yes, of course it does, but it doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. I get people come up to me after and say, Dave, we have a history of heart disease or we have a history of breast cancer. Yes, I understand all that, but there's so much you can do to stack the cards in your favour. It's not an excuse anymore. So health is what you give yourselves, guys, through diet and lifestyle. People run to the doctor and say, fix me. Why don't you fix yourself? Because most of the time, we actually can. So now I've got that off my chest, I feel a whole lot better. Right. <laughs> diet, I love this because the first three words generally describe most diets, by the way. Okay, they're killing people, to be honest. And this business here, you see this, this, this whole thing of the, the ape and then he ends up in front of the, the screen. You know, one funny thing about life today is that it's so handy, isn't it? These. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. Would you, for God's sake, spend 30 minutes a day and turn the goddamn things off? And in all fairness, if I'm speaking to you <coughs> and my phone rings now, or even if we're, well, we're having a drink or some my phone rings, do you know what I'll do? It can ring. I'm with you. Do you know what I mean? I mean, yes, there's a, there's a time when it's important, I understand that, but it's not life and death. 
I people go into shops and they say, yeah, I'll have this, this, and this, and that, but they won't even, I wouldn't serve somebody. What have we become? You're on a bloody train, and you hear somebody's operation in great detail by the time you've got to the end of the journey. You're trying to have a meal in peace. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff. I can't make the hair stand on the back of your head. But on a serious note, yes, they are important. I understand all of that. But our kids even, I mean, kids before they're a year old, they're given tablets to play with, to play these little games and stuff like that. I know it keeps them quiet, and I know it gets their brain going and all that, but it, you've got to be very, very careful. Because it's a fine line, guys. Take them out and show them the grass or flowers or, I don't know, animals or something. But this, is, this species here, unfortunately, yes, people are... Now, look out your window, people are running, they're going to the gym, they're going to yoga class. Yes, people are going out more, I do agree. But still, there's a huge amount of this. You know, how, much, how, bigger, how much bigger can you get a screen in a house? You know, there used to be 40 inch, or woo, then I went to 42 inch. Now it's 50 inch, now you can get a 56 inch. Jesus, why don't you put the whole wall just to screen <laughs> while you're at it? I mean, you can only see someone, you want to climb into it? I mean, <laughs> I, I really need my hobby horse. And this species, by the way, you love it. I call this species here the Homo erectus because it does wreck it. And I made that word up myself, and I'm very proud of that, all right? So there you go, the Western world guys is undernourished and overweight, and this is really the meat of what I want to say here today. We can go into the reception there, there's a, there's a, a small little eating place there, and we can also go into the restaurant, we can go out the door, I think there's a, a value supermarket just down the road there. We can go, within five minutes we can get food. I'm not talking about food, I'm talking about nutrition. I'm talking about nutrient-dense food. Where can we get it? So the Western world, we're undernourished and overweight, and the other half of the world is starving. So it's a huge, huge issue at the moment. No wonder we're seeing the types of sickness we are. Do you know we have never had so much food in the world, particularly the Western world? Never. We've never had so much medication in the world, pharmaceuticals. We've never had so much information on the World Wide Web, and yet we've never been sicker. What the hell is going on? We have to take a stand. We really do. And stand up and be counted. This is a problem. On one side of our body, you get all these attacks poor diet, radiation. Medication, pollution, it's all that. The list goes on and on and on. But the problem is that's okay, but if you're going to do something about the other side of it, on one side you've got that, on the other side we're not putting enough nutrient dense food into our body. It's a huge problem. So we have to try and get that balance right. Have a look at this. This is an interesting statistic, by the way. This is not me, this is from the European Food Institution. Less meat is made from scratch nowadays. Okay, processed and already prepared meals. People pop it into a microwave. And God forbid if you have a microwave, please, anyone of you here, when you go home tonight, will you take it out of your house and dig a hole and bury it six foot deep? Because if you don't, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you live. I will find you. <laughs> and when I do, I will take your microwave away. I mean, you know, I saw this on television, and Irish television there, and it had this new porridge, this organic porridge. Microwave it for a minute. Why don't you eat the bloody wrapper? There's more nutrition in it. I'm telling you, a microwave kills it as a live food. And people say I don't have time. I don't not buy that. That's not true. I did a, a talk in the States and there was a large audience again. And I said, listen, I would give any, like any one of you here, I'll give you a pizza and an oven. And I would take a colander and a load of water, lots of holes in the colander. I'd throw in a half a dozen veg and I would have them lightly steamed before your pizza's even halfway done. So don't tell me you don't have time. You do have time. We have plenty of time. So the preparation time now is 15 minutes, that's average. And by the way, you can make a beautiful nutritious meal in five minutes. Isn't that right, Sue? Yes, absolutely. You're going to make one for me when I'm finished now, are you? I hope. <laughs> I'm starving. Do you know that? Really? I haven't eaten yet. Would you believe it? Um, so anyway, look at the statistics. 1965, we were consuming two kilos of fruit and vegetables. Uh, I beg your pardon, two kilos of processed food. Today, 37 kilos. Now, if you do not believe me, think about this. Have a look at your shopping trolley on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday coming up. And think of Dave O'Brien, the crazy desert guy, right? And look at your shopping trolley. And I promise you, or somebody else's, okay, somebody else's. And I promise you, 95% of it would be processed, pre-cooked, pre-tinned, pre-frozen, pre-packaged. And 5% of that would be live food. And I'm going to take it home, cook it, and get it. <laughs> think about it. Seriously, guys, think about it. Where are we getting the nutrient-dense food from? Is it any wonder we see type 2 diabetes in children and all persons' disease? How about hardening the arteries in 12 years old? People say this is in America. No, it's not. It's here. It's happening here. It's happening at home. And you don't have to be obese to be ill. You can be a normal thin size and you can be very ill. What are we doing to ourselves? We need nutrient-dense food. I put this slide up in Tel Aviv recently. It didn't go down too well, by the way. 
I said, I'm going to show you the weapon of mass destruction. Seriously. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not joking. I, I, for once, I'm actually being serious. I said, I'm going to show you the weapon of mass destruction. And I put this up. And uh, well, there you go. <laughs> and this is a weapon of mass destruction. You know why? Because this kills more people in the world than any other weapon. White bread. You know, processed food, chocolate. I mean... He, he, the white, and white for me, I don't take white anyway. I think white is poison. White sugar, white pasta, white bread. Forget about it. I was in the supermarket years ago. You know, you get these rolls. I said, I'll have a brown roll, please. And the lady behind the counter said, We don't have brown, only white. Blast it. And I go, Give me a white one. So she said, What do you want on it? I said, Hang on, before you start, can you take the, the center out of it? Now, this is before people start doing it years later. This is the very start. Of it. She said, You want me to take the center out? I said, Yeah, sure. Okay. So she peeled it all away. I said, Can I have it, please? You want it? No. I said, Yes. So I took it and I squashed it in my hand and I opened it. See that? I said, That's dough. That is just one lump that's going to stick in. I started giving the hallelujah on, on the head. There's about 50 people behind me hearing the music in the background. I didn't go into that shop again after that. But anyway, <laughs> but this is it. This is a weapon of mass destruction. And you know, when you, when I show this to people, it, it kind of resonates. And for, for some of you in the audience, and this is a great slide, it really is. For those who think they have no time for healthy eating, sooner or later, they'll have to find time for illness. Isn't it, isn't it terrific? It's a great slide. I know, it's actually, would you believe it, it's kind of off the screen, all this stuff, isn't it? Can you bring it up? A bit nearer to you. Is that a little bit better? How about that? Yeah. Look at that. So, great slide. So, I just saw somebody taking pictures, so you get the whole thing in if you want it. No problem. Uh, now, oh, there he goes. You saw him too late. Well, that was... <laughs> I went to Dublin Zoo, seriously, in Christmas uh, this year. I had just gone, and uh, I went over the wall of the zoo. It was midnight, so it was okay. Had my ninja gear on. Yeah. I, I went to the compound. I lassoed this giru giraffe. I brought him home to my back garden, fed it full of processed food, chocolate bars and all that kind of stuff, uh, for a month, and uh, this is what happened to him. There you go. <laughs> but, you know, seriously, guys, uh, I did take a bit of artistic license on this, but if we did feed the giraffe the food that we eat as humans, this is exactly what would happen. Um, love this too, this is another big slide I use. People who are fed by the food industry, which pays little or no attention to health, and we're treated by a health industry, which pays little or no attention to food. And, uh, you know, this is, this is so true. And if you don't believe me, if you go into accident and emergency in any hospital, and have a look at what machines are in the reception area, area am I right? It'll be busy dreams, it'll be crisps. It'll be, where's the broccoli stalks? Where? Okay, but, but that's the way it is. So I think this is a great slide. We're fed by the food industry, which pays little or no attention to health, and we're treated by a health industry, which pays little or no attention to food. Uh, anyone here in the audience that's big into uh, in their exercise, sport, and so on, just very briefly, I want to show you this slide because it's important. Uh, I often ask an audience, it's not a trick question, by the way, is exercise good for you? Yeah? It is, of course. Of course, it's good for the heart, the lungs, the cardiovascular. But the problem is, uh, when you exercise, and the more you exercise, the more free radical damage you produce. It's a bit like that car that I showed there. You see, when you turn on your engine, when you go in outside now in a minute, you get this bad exhaust. Nowadays, you don't see it. It's all the CO2 emissions are, are, are right down. But, but generally, you turn on your ignition, you get bad exhaust. Put your foot on the pedal to go faster, you get more bad exhaust, yeah? We're the same. Our bodies are exactly the same. You've all eaten today, except me. So you've all eaten today, and you're burning that food for fuel at the moment. You're creating that free radical damage up here, yeah? So what would happen if I took you outside the door and we ran around this building as fast as we could? Guess what? You create more bad exhaust. So is exercise good for you? Well, yes and no. Now, this is okay because this happens at the cellular level all the time. But we must make sure that we don't, don't get an imbalance wrong. We must try and treat this for radical damage. And that's why when athletes go out and do, you know, whether training, whether in competition, the first thing they need to do when the minute they finish, and obviously about an hour and a half before, but when they finish, put raw food into the body, nutrient-dense food. Not these sports drinks or bars or anything, but near me. They tried to give it to my kids and I went, eight hey, all together. Because these things do exactly what they say on the tin. Of course they do, they're sugar fix. Yeah, sure, if you want that 10 minute rush, you know, before the end of a match or whatever, yes, take it. But I tell you one thing, it is short-term gain and long-term detriment to your body. And you will know about it, trust me. Oh, not now, but 10, 15, 20 years down the road. It's crap, you do not need it. Take it from someone that has done these things in my life. I have never, ever, from a sports drink, a gel, a powder, they tried to shove a gel into my mouth in the desert when that happened to me, when I had the, the they were giving me a modium and stuff. 
and I was losing. They tried to shove a gel in and I was spitting it out. I would not take it. It's poison for God's sake. Anyway, so what I would say is it's all about repairing that damage. Oxidative stress is the big one. And I, I, I guess you know <laughs> oxidative stress, free radical damage, lipids in the blood. And what this does to us, guys, basically is like the apple rotting away. Free radical damage predisposes to heart disease, stroke, cancer, speeds up the aging process. And these are, these are real problems. And you get this from, oh, from stress. Don't tell me you're not stressed. If you want to see stress, come to the Kinsale Roundabout in Cork. <laughs> on a Monday morning, you'll see it. Uh, I did a talk in London. There was a woman accused of killing her two children. It was really sad. She had a beautiful mop of dark hair. And one month later in prison, they took another picture, put it side by side. Her hair was white. So if stress does that on the outside, what the hell is it doing on the inside? It is the biggest killer of our time, stress. And that's why I say to them, please, stop. Be in the moment. Do you know, I'm not asking you to run around and hug trees. <laughs> can if you want to. But seriously, I'm just saying, give that time out to you, that 30 minutes a day. I don't care what it is. One simple change in your life. Give that time away from the mobile phone, away from the husband, away from the wife, away from the children. Just try and get that 30 minutes for you. I mean, away from everything. Just breathe. Be in the moment. I, I run down on my bare feet in the fields, and I run and go and come by me and say, hey, how's it going? He doesn't answer. And as he goes by, I see the wire. Yeah, I understand people like music and they love all this stuff. Again, that's fine, I have no problem with that. But sometimes take the damn thing out. Feel the wind in your face. Listen to the sounds around you. You hear that bird outside, a pigeon outside? Mm -hmm. People don't even hear that anymore. So try and do that if you can, you know what I mean? Now, if I had a shotgun for him as well, I'd have my dinner. <laughs> dinner. Okay, so the free radical stress, let's get through it near the end of the smoking. So you get, basically, what happens is you, the cause of free radicals are all these things. Smoking, diet, pollution, medication. Uh, radiation and of course exercise. So when we're alive at all, if we're being hit, we're, get, we're, we're creating this free radical damage through all of these areas here. So you can see now why we see the damage to bodies that we're seeing, why we see the sicknesses we're seeing out there. Because all these things, not one on their own, none, none, nothing on their own there will kill you, well, over time possibly. But all of them together, and we are all exposed to something. And by the way, do you see when I show, show radiation, people think I'm talking about flying, 35,000 feet you got radiated. Oh, I'm talking about mobile phones. I'm talking about your home phone where you walk around the house. I'm talking about your sky television. I'm talking about them. I'm talking about here. This is a Wi-Fi free zone. You know the power it needs to generate electromagnetic waves so that we can, our phones can pick it up. Do you really think that's doing no harm over time? Come on, guys. Of course it is. It won't kill you. But when you put it to everything else, is there any wonder we're seeing increases in heart disease? Do you know in Ireland, 27 people die, and we've only five million of the population. 27 people die every day of the week in Ireland through heart disease. And wait for this, the majority of that, the majority of that 90% plus is preventable through diet and lifestyle. And the big one, the majority of that is reversible through diet and lifestyle, not through pills. So this is the, the, the cause of it. So to get rid of the free rat, not get rid of them, you never will, it's part of, the, uh, of your metabolism, it'll happen. You're gonna put a lot of antioxidants in there to try and balance one thing out against the other. We need to fight these antioxidants, this oxidative stress with antioxidants that are found in fruits and vegetables. We need to combat this oxi oxidative stress, free radical damage. So really and truly, fruits and veggies are where it's at. Now, some people say, did I fly over from Ireland or come from Exeter and bring everybody in today? Just as we're finishing now, tell you that fruits and vegetables are good for you. Yes. In fact, so good for you that can save your life. I mean, the World Health Organization take it so seriously that every two years they have a symposium on fruits and vegetables and how to get more fruits and vegetables in the nations of all around the world. The, 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 what is it? The British Heart Foundation, the British Cancer Society are screaming at us. Your, your, your doctor, your local GP, take your fruits and vegetables. Granny was right, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Mind you, you need about 25 apples a day today to keep the doctor away. But anyway, all right then. So fruits and vegetables are good for you. And just to show this to no children in the room, fine, I got this slide in Denmark. I do a lot of work in Scandinavia. I think it's very apt. Just in case you don't believe me that fruits and vegetables are good for you, there you go. And, um, <laughs> it's a great slide. You know the funny thing about this slide, I, I hope I don't offend anyone because I don't mean to. It's only a bit of fun. But I would say one thing. I cannot show this slide in America. I can't, honestly. Now, yes, I can walk into a gun shop, gun shop, shop and buy a rocket launcher across the counter, but I can't show a picture of fruits and vegetables getting it on together. <laughs> Don't get it. All right, let's move along quickly and swiftly. Um, 
so really, it's a responsibility is ours. We need to start putting more fruits and vegetables. We need to look at our lifestyles. Little small changes. You're, look, when I finish now in a minute, you're all going to go away, aren't you, and drink 10 liters of water a day and eat raw broccoli stock. No, no you're not, guys. Come on. You're not. You're going to turn the key in your ignition, and life is going to go back to normal. Be honest with me. And that's habit, and that's, and that's nothing you know, offensive. That's the way it is. But if you can just make one simple change tonight, that extra glass of water a day, that go to bed an hour earlier, take that little time out for you, do it for a month, it becomes a habit, and then, then take some, another simple change. One simple change a month, it becomes a habit, then another simple change. That's a job well done. Boom, we're getting there. Yeah? So by changing diet and lifestyle, we can do so, so much for ourselves. So this is a Hippocrates, a food, food be thy medicine, the medicine be thy food. He was way ahead of his time. This is the pharmacy I go to, not a P-H-A-R-M, but an F-A-R-M. That's the pharmacy I go to, and that's the drugs that I take, tomatoes and cucumbers. That's what it's all about. And of course, this is the doctor I would love to go to, please God, but if I'm alive and on the planet, I want to go to a doctor. And this is what I say, that a doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Isn't that brilliant? Can you imagine going to a doctor like that? The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Would you think that that saying is a fairly recent one? It's not. No, it's Thomas Edison. Yeah, 1847 to 1931. Clever man, he was way ahead of the posse. So at the end of the day, guys, it's about bridging that nutritional gap. How are we gonna do it? As I said, you're not gonna walk out here and eat tons of vegetables raw, uncooked. It's not gonna happen. Um, for me, it happened uh, at the final part of this presentation, we're almost done. It's, um, I came across Juice Plus, I was asked to go to a health seminar, knew nothing about it. I, I think there was a doctor there, there was a nutritionist, and there was a presenter from RT, our television station, and um, a chef. And it was grand, it was good, like, it was an interesting thing. And then this swimmer came up, our Olympic swimmer. His name was Gary O'Toole, he's a medical doctor now, and he stood up, like, you're in the audience, I'm in the audience, he says, I said, I spend more time in the water these days than I do on land. Three times a day I'm in the water. And he says, obviously my recovery and repair is, is, is crucial. So he said, my Olympic doctor came up to me and he said, take this. He said, what is it, a vitamin? It's not vitamins, food. Uh, it was Juice Plus. And I had never heard of it before, I said, right, okay. He said, I took it for a month. And I found no difference whatsoever. I said, tried it for another month, two months. And I still found no difference. Three months, and I found no difference. I turned to my friend Eddie, I said, Jesus, this coach Juice Plus better get a different speed, because this is going pear shape. <laughs> he said, I fell no difference after three months, but what he said next is the reason I'm here today. Honestly, another pivotal moment in my life. He said, I fell no difference, but my doctors did. You see, what are the World anti doping Agency? And also, his own doctors were taking bloods, and they found this massive increase of antioxidants running through his veins, by over 75%. Now, bearing in mind, that if you, if you can reduce your free radical damage by 75%, not your antioxidants, your free radical damage, by 75% reduce, free, I'm bearing in mind that free radicals predisposes to heart disease, stroke, cancer, speeds up the aging process. He was telling me and the rest of the audience, a thousand people, that it had reduced by over 75%. Now either he's over-exaggerating, he's excited, he's misinformed, or maybe he's lying to me. What if Juice Plus gave him a bunch of money to give me a load of crap? But what if he's not? What if it was true? See, my mother brought me up, not just go on opinions. Opinions are like belly buttons. We all have them and they're all different. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But seriously, do you know what I mean? I had people around me, oh, it's snake oil and it's pyramid and it's gone. Yeah, I heard all that. But I was thinking, what if it's true? What if man has actually found a way to get raw fruits, vegetables, very enzyme intact, still with the fiber, encapsulated? What if it was true? Oh, not instead of a good diet, but with a good diet. Bridging that nutritional gap. There's no way I have a perfect diet. Nobody here is a perfect diet. Come on, unless you live under a banana tree and wait for the bananas to fall on your lap, then you have a gap. Everybody has a gap. And I'm thinking, what if this is true? What if they are right? I don't want to miss out. And that day, I made the decision that I would get Juice Plus. That was in 1995, somewhere in 1995, 21 years ago. I'm taking Juice Plus that length of time. And this can happen to you too, unfortunately. You'll be running around the place like a blue ass tonight. <laughs> my wife and my children, you saw the picture there. It's a Juice Plus family, we call it. Uh, uh, this is our 18th year on Juice Plus. My mum, bless her, she was the hardest nut to crack. She really was. Mum is on Juice Plus eight years. And the difference, 
And she's my mother, and I can tell her story, because she's my mum. Mum would not shut up if she was up here talking about it. Her blood, her memory, her skin. She said to me, I remember ages ago, Dave, I'm 80 years of age at the time. I said, yeah, we're always in a mode of healing. Always. I don't care what age you are. Yes, your metabolism slows, and I know all that, but we're always in a constant mode, mode of healing. So my mum's on the eight years, and uh, everyone that, you know, people that I love and care about around Jesus Christ. And by the way, speaking of that, whoever invited you here today thought enough of you to invite you along. And if I ever meet anybody again, and I hope I meet some of you again, if I ever meet you in the street, you can never look Dave O'Brien in the eye and say that you don't know about Jesus Christ anymore. That's not an excuse. You know about it. You've heard about it. What you do with that information, it's up to you, trust me. So I'm not into convincing here. And uh, I did a talk for a football team. It's important to mention this, and everything was going fine with the deserts and the macho stuff. And when I came to Juice Plus, like I am at the finish here with the slide, a guy shouts up from the back of the room, are you making money out of this? Am I making money out of this? And I stopped, and I looked at him. I went, yes, absolutely. Isn't it brilliant to be able to make money and help people with their health at the same time? I don't understand that question. Seriously, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, what would they prefer? That I, I sell chocolate bars or crisps or drugs or cigarettes? Of course I make money out of it. It's fantastic. The bigger my check, the more people I'm helping. I don't care how much of a cli cliche that is. That is an absolute fact. Stone Cold. You can see it in me. I mean, how passionate I am about it. It has transformed the lives of people I love. So that's my story on Juice Plus. And as I said, if you want any information afterwards, there's lots of people around that will help you. We don't do a catalogue of products, by the way. There's no such thing. We just do fruit, veg, and berries encapsulated. That's it. I'm sure we could do makeup. I'm sure we could do pots and pans. <laughs> I'm sure we could do shampoos, shoe shines, and make billions of pounds. We could. The CEO could throw it into a range. 23 years later, it's still only Juice Plus. 13 and a half billion. Do you think if Juice Plus was a heap of crap, I, I think we might have got a year out of it, made a couple of million and be gone. It's getting stronger and stronger. The UK, by the way, is the biggest growing market in the world. <coughs> and we haven't even scratched the scratch yet. Okay, so there you go. And this is the only other thing we have. That's the, macro, the micronutrients in the fruit, veg, and berries. We don't have any here. And this is the macronutrients. This is protein, plant protein. It is plant-based protein. No dairy or sucrose, no caffeine, no saturated fats. It is not acidic, it's alkaline. I wouldn't touch any of the whales or anything like that. This is beautiful. If there's anything better on the, in, in the market, I'd be taking it. And just to tell you how good this is, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but the PDCAAS of your protein powder is the internationally, not my opinion, is the internationally accepted standard for protein quality. A perfect score of 1.0 is tops. Juice Plus has a score of 1.0 and is the only plant-based protein to ever achieve that rating, the highest quality protein a human can consume. As I said, if there was anything any better out there, juice plus or not juice plus, I'd be taking it. I lived on that. I'm going to interrupt you in a moment yeah. because you're starving. Yes.